Hey everyone, it's Dr. Marcon. This is the lecture video on chapter 13 on the central nervous system. So we know the main structures of the central nervous system include the brain and the spinal cord. Some directional terms that are unique to the central nervous system. Rostral, rostral means toward the nose, whereas caudal means toward the tail. We encountered um, a word that had caudal in it, like cauda equina. Uh, cauda equina meant horse's tail, and that was a structure that we saw at the distal end of the spinal cord. So caudal means toward the tail. We know the brain controls the heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, also controls the autonomic nervous system with our sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, nervous system. It controls the endocrine system with our glands um, and how our glands affect all sorts of stuff like uh, our metabolism. Brain is also involved in the innervation of the head through the cranial nerves. The brain performs the most complex neural functions, including intelligence, consciousness, memory, sensory motor integration, emotion, behavior, and socialization. Uh, we know that uh, Einstein used more of the brain or his brain than most people. So again, Einstein used more of his brain than most people because we only know that um, most humans use very, you know, a very small part of our brain. Whereas Einstein, being the genius that he is, I'm sure he used um, more of his brain than most people. So the brain arises from the rostral part of the neural tube. Rostral again towards the nose. Uh, there are three primary brain vesicles in the four-week-old embryo. First being the prosencephalon. The prosencephalon, also known as the forebrain. Okay, so the prosencephalon is also known as the forebrain. The mesencephalon is known as the midbrain. And the rhombencephalon uh, is also known as the hindbrain. So these are sort of the easy names. Uh, for the different brain vesicles. So prosencephalon forebrain, mesencephalon midbrain, and then rhombencephalon, the hindbrain. Now these brain vesicles will then further divide into secondary brain vesicles. Okay, so we have primary brain vesicles, we have three primary brain vesicles, and then we have our secondary brain vesicles. So the prosencephalon will further divide into the teal encephalon and the diencephalon. The mesencephalon actually just remains undivided and remains the mesencephalon. And then the rhombencephalon will eventually divide into the metencephalon and the myelencephalon. Okay, so make sure you know the difference between primary brain vesicles and secondary brain vesicles. So then we can see the structures of the adult brain that will develop from the secondary brain vesicles. So for example, the telencephalon will eventually become the cerebral hemispheres. The diencephalon, uh, we know, uh, form the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus, okay? So these are structures that we are able to already identify in lab. Uh, diencephalon being the thalamus, hypothalamus, and epithalamus. The metencephalon will then become the pons and the cerebellum. And then the myelencephalon becoming uh, the last part of the brainstem, the medulla oblongata. The brainstem includes the midbrain, pons, and medulla oblongata. And then we have uh, the ventricles. The ventricles are the central cavity of uh, the neural tube that enlarges. Okay. Uh, ventricles, we'll talk more about the ventricles and the flow of cerebral spinal fluid in just a little bit. So here we see um, the primary brain vesicles at week four. We have our three primary brain vesicles. We have a prosencephalon, an easy name for that is forebrain. We have the mesencephalon, easy name for that is midbrain, and the rhombencephalon, uh, an easy name for that is the hindbrain. And by week five, we finally have our secondary brain vesicles. Uh, we know that the telencephalon um, is 
is coming from the prosencephalon as well as the diencephalon. And we can see that um, these structures kind of look like Mickey Mouse ears. Um, so once they develop in the uh, adult brain, these Mickey Mouse ears um, are will be known as the cerebrum. So we have the right and left cerebrum, okay, coming from the telencephalon. But notice they do look like Mickey Mouse ears. Good to know. So telencephalon, the secondary brain vessel will eventually become uh, with the adult structures, the cerebrum, cerebral hemispheres, including the cortex, the white matter, and the basal nuclei. Um, diencephalon uh, will have these structures, the thalamus, hypothalamus, the epithalamus, and also the retina within the eye. Um, mesencephalon stays. Mesencephalon, adult brain structures are the brainstem, uh, particularly that first part of the brainstem, which is the midbrain. And then from the rhombencephalon, we have the two secondary brain vesicles, the metencephalon and the myelencephalon. Metencephalon becoming the brainstem and the pons, as well as the cerebellum. And then the myelencephalon becoming uh, the medulla oblongata of the brainstem. Um, and then this uh, distal portion uh, becoming the spinal cord. Now within these structures, we have the ventricles. Um, we have our lateral ventricles, uh, within the cerebrum, within the different right and left cerebral hemispheres. Lateral ventricles will then uh, drain into the third ventricle via the interventricular foramen. Um, so we have that third ventricle uh, kind of uh, squished within the diencephalon. And then from the third ventricle, cerebral spinal fluid will then drain into the cerebral aqueduct uh, found within are posterior to the midbrain. And then from the cerebral aqueduct, we saw that uh, it drained into the fourth ventricle, which was posterior to the pons, but uh, kind of anterior to the cerebellum, that space in front of or uh, anterior to the cerebellum, and that's the fourth ventricle. Um, and then from the fourth ventricle, it will either go through the lateral or medial apertures, the lateral aperture of Lushka, or the medial aperture of Magendi to go to uh, the rest of uh, the brain, uh, traveling within the subarachnoid matter, um, one of the meninges surrounding the brain, or it will go through the central canal within the spinal cord. We know that the brain grows very rapidly. Uh, changes occur in the relative position of its parts. The cerebral hemispheres develop into the, uh, or, I'm sorry, the cerebral hemispheres will envelope the diencephalon and midbrain. And then we have wrinkling of the cerebral hemispheres, meaning uh, more neurons will fit into within the limited space. Now, the evolutionary process of packing more brains into the skull um, is called uh, cephalization. So cephalization is the evolutionary process of packing more brain cells into the skull. Uh, going back to the uh, secondary vesicles, just some factoids about the secondary vesicles. Uh, we know that um, the myelencephalon, um, this part of the uh, secondary brain vesicle, vesicles, not much thinking happens in this part of the brain actually. Uh, we consider this uh, to be the part where reflexes mostly occur. So just reflex, just reflexes happen in the myelencephalon, uh, not much thinking. Another little factoid is uh, the metencephalon. We know the metencephalon um, becomes the brainstem as well as the cerebellum. Um, it is considered the stern of the head because it does form the cerebellum, which is basically the, the most posterior portion of the head. So met encephalon considered to be the stern of the head. Again, cephalization um, is the evolutionary process of packing more brains into the skull. Um, you know, we have our brain growing very rapidly, trying to fit as many neurons within a limited space, uh, causing wrinkling of the cerebral hemispheres. On the next slide, you can actually see the brain development from uh, from week five to adulthood to or I'm sorry to birth. 
sorry. So first we see uh, in week five, we have two major flexures that form. So we have flexures at the midbrain and we have cervical flexures. Then by week 13, uh, the cerebral hemispheres will grow posterior laterally, which then enclose the diencephalon and the rostral brainstem. So growing posterior laterally, um, the cerebral hemispheres, again, week 13, and kind of uh, enveloping the diencephalon, which eventually will become our uh, thalamus, hypothalamus, and such. And then at week 26, the surface of the cerebrum begins to fold as we're packing in more neurons. Um, and by birth, we can see that the brain starts showing that uh, adult pattern of structures with the sulci and the gyri um, and all the secondary vesicles becoming uh, a, the uh, human structures that we know, uh, such as the cerebrum, uh, the diencephalon, holding the thalamus, hypothalamus, and the pituitary gland, and then we have the cerebellum, as well as parts of the brainstem. So focusing on basic parts and organization of the brain, we know that the brain is classified into four regions. We have the brainstem made up of the midbrain, pons, and medulla. We have the cerebellum, we have the diencephalon, and then we have our right and left cerebral hemispheres. The organization of the brain, we have a centrally located gray matter and then an externally located white matter. Uh, there will be an additional layer of gray matter external to the white matter uh, due to groups of neurons migrating externally. So like most um, organs, the outer layer of gray matter is considered or <clears throat> is called the cortex and is formed from neuronal cell bodies. Uh, cortex can be located in the cerebrum and the cerebellum. So here we can see the pattern of gray and white matter in the CNS, just a simplified um, pattern. So here in the upper parts of the uh, CNS, located here at the um, sort of the beginning part of the, uh, the, sp the spinal cord, we can see a cortex of gray matter. Um, and then we have outer white matter and then an inner uh, gray matter here surrounding the central cavity. And then around, so this is the region of the cerebellum, and here at the brainstem, we can see outer white matter here, uh, inner gray matter surrounding the central cavity, and then finally we get to uh, distal portions of the spinal cord, we'll have that outer white matter, and then the inner gray matter uh, making up the different horns of the spinal cord, our uh, ventral and dorsal horns. And then uh, here's our, our central commissure or commissure, and then that uh, central cavity here. Now the ventricles of the brain, again, these are filled with fluid. Ventricles of the brain are filled with fluid. They are expansions of the brain's central cavity. Um, they are filled with cerebral spinal fluid and lined with ependymal cells. The ventricles are continuous with each other um, and are continuous with the central canal of the spinal cord. First, we have the lateral ventricles. These are located in the cerebral hemispheres. They are horseshoe shaped uh, from bending of the cerebral hemispheres. The lateral ventricles uh, will then, um, the cerebral spinal fluid will, will flow from the lateral ventricles through the interventricular foramen to the third ventricle, which lies within the diencephalon. And uh, again, connected with the vent uh, lateral ventricles by the interventricular foramen. From the third ventricle, cerebral spinal fluid will then flow into the cerebral aqueduct. Uh, the cerebral aqueduct uh, connects the third and the fourth ventricles. Um, so from the cere cerebral aqueduct, cerebral spinal fluid will then flow into the fourth ventricle, which lies in the hindbrain. We saw it kind of anterior towards the, uh, or anterior to the cerebellum, posterior to the pons of the brainstem. The fourth ventricle um, connects to the central canal of the spinal cord. So in this next picture, we can see the actual ventricles within the brain. So we see these large lateral ventricles, um, right and left, which will then be connected to the uh, 
third ventricle via the interventricular foramen here. And then from the third ventricle, which is kind of enveloped by the diencephalon, uh, cerebral spinal fluid will then drain into the cerebral aqueduct. From the cerebral aqueduct, CSF will then flow into this diamond's like structure, the um, fourth ventricle. Again, that fourth ventricle, that space kind of anterior to the cerebellum, uh, posterior to the pons of the brainstem. And then the um, cerebral spinal fluid will either, either travel through the central canal within the spinal cord or will go through the different apertures, the median aperture of Magendi or the lateral aperture of Lushka, going into the subarachnoid space. Uh, within the meninges of the brain, kind of added, adding more cushion and such. The brainstem includes the midbrain, pons, and the medulla oblongata. It has several general funct functions. It provides the passageway for all fiber tracts running between the brain and the spinal cord, uh, between the cerebrum and the spinal cord. It, will, it is heavily involved with the innervation of the face and head, uh, Brainstem contains 10 of the 12 pairs of cranial nerves uh, that are attached to it. General functions of the brainstem also include uh, automatic behaviors necessary for survival, um, integrates auditory and visual reflexes. Okay, so again, not much thinking happens in, uh, in the um, myelencephalon but just reflexes, okay? So we have auditory and visual reflexes. So here we see a ventral view of the brain showing the, um, not only the cranial nerves, but the three parts of the brainstem. So the first part being the midbrain here, uh, and we see a uh, mammillary body there. Um, we have the midbrain, we have the pons, and then we have the medulla oblongata, which is then continuous with the spinal cord. And make sure you are comfortable identifying the cranial nerves um, on a ventral portion of the brain or a ventral view of the brain. So most of the caudal level of the brainstem is continuous with the spinal cord. Um, we know that there is a choroid plexus that produces cerebral spinal fluid that lies in the roof of the fourth ventricle. We have external landmarks of the medulla oblongata. We have the pyramids that lie on the ventral surface. Um, we have the decussation of the pyramids. Uh, we talked about the decussation of the pyramids. This is the crossing over of the motor tracks or the motor axons that um, will go down towards the effector organs, such as our muscles or our um, glands, okay? So we have a crossing over of motor tracks. For, so if we have a lesion on the right side of our brain, it will affect the left side of the body because of this crossing over of the motor tracks here at the decussation of the pyramids. Also within the medulla, we have the inferior cerebellar peduncles, uh, these are the fiber, these contain fiber tracts connecting the medulla and the cerebellum. And then we have the olives, uh, or the olive of the medulla that contains inferior olive very nuclei, again, uh, that provide connections to the cerebellum. Within the medulla, there are actually four pairs of cranial nerves uh, attached to it. So we have cranial nerve eight, which is the vestibulocochlear nerve. Uh, we have cranial nerve nine, which is the glossopharyngeal nerve. Um, if you ever want to test this nerve, the glossopharyngeal nerve, ask a patient to stick out their tongue. Oh, I'm sorry, that's hypoglossal. For nine, um, this actually provides the gag reflex. So if you spell gag, G-A-G, -A, um, a G and a nine and G actually kind of look like gag. So uh, cranial nerve nine is glossopharyngeal, test the gag reflex. Um, cranial nerve 10 is the vagus nerve. Um, and then cranial nerve 12, this is the hypoglossal nerve. This is the nerve that in order to test out, you ask a patient to, to stick out their tongue because uh, it provides innervation to um, the muscles of the tongue. So again, here we see the brainstem. Um, we can see the, uh, the midbrain here with the cerebral uh, peduncles. Uh, we have the pons, very important uh, cranial nerve off of the pons is this large trigeminal nerve located laterally. 
along the uh, lateral borders of the pons. And then um, at the base of the pons, we see the facial nerve. Uh, and then here is our uh, medulla oblongata. We can see these structures um, making up the pyramids. And then we have a decussation or crossing over, decussation of the pyramids, where we have a crossing over of the uh, motor axons. Okay. Um, and then we see our lateral to the, uh, to the pyramids, with uh, lateral to the medulla oblongata, we have our, uh, our different cranial nerves. Uh, one that you do need to take note of is the vestibulocochlear nerve here. And then, um, so it goes eight and then nine. Where is nine? Nine here is the, um, glossopharyngeal nerve. Uh, and then more inferior, um, and still on that lateral border is the vagus nerve, which is 10. And then uh, we have 11, which is spinal accessory nerve. And then more medial will be 12, the hypoglossal nerve. So just a lateral view of the brainstem. Again, we can kind of see um, the different cranial nerves. Now, um, more anterior of the midbrain, we see our colliculi. So we have our superior colliculi and an inferior colliculi, which we talked about in lab. Uh, superior colliculi being responsible for our visual reflexes and um, tracking and following moving objects, like uh, watching a finger kind of go across our face. Um, and then the inferior colliculi uh, belongs to our auditory system. So act in a reflexive, uh, responsive way towards a sound. Like if we hear, you know, my cat in the background, I can uh, kind of turn my head towards the sound. So the superior and inferior colliculi, again, are part of the corpora quadrigemina um, found uh, anterior to the, uh, the midbrain of the brainstem. Okay, so superior colliculi, inferior colliculi, part of the corpora quadrigemina. So the medulla oblongata, uh, the core of the medulla contains much of the reticular formation. Uh, these, the nuclei found within the reticular formation influence autonomic functions. We also have our visceral centers of the reticular information, which include our cardiac center, our vasomotor center, the medullary, uh, I'm sorry, medullary respiratory center, and then our centers for hiccuping, sneezing, swallowing, and coughing. Okay. Now you're not going to be responsible for identifying and locating all these centers. Um, just make sure you are able to identify the cranial nerves that you're responsible for, as well as the structures that we talked about in lab. So again, um, these structures making up uh, the different parts of the brainstem. Okay, so we have the midbrain, we have the pons, and when and then we have the medulla oblongata. And then these are the nuclei. So these cells here, uh, they're considered nuclei. Again, uh, these nuclei are centers for our visceral centers, okay? You're not responsible for identifying all of them. Uh, just know that they exist. So the pons is a bridge between the midbrain and the medulla, medulla oblongata and contains these cranial nerves, the trigenal nerve, which you need to identify. It's the large nerve lateral to uh, the pons. We have the abducens nerve, which is responsible for moving certain muscles within the eye. Um, and then we have the facial nerve, uh, facial nerve responsible for uh, innervations to the face. We know that the pons contains motor tracts coming from the cerebral cortex, which go down the spinal cord to the effector organs. Uh, pons contains pontine nuclei, which connect portions of the cerebral cortex and the cerebellum uh, that send axons to the cerebellum through the middle cerebellar peduncles. Okay, so basically we know that the brainstem does help provide connections from the brain to the cerebellum. Again, the cerebellum, uh, we talked about them being an important structure for uh, coordination of movements and balance and such. 
So the midbrain, um, the more is the more um, proximal portion of the brainstem, lies between the diencephalon and the pons, contains the cerebral aqueduct, uh, which is the central cavity of the midbrain, so cerebral aqueduct connecting the third and the fourth ventricles. Um, within the midbrain, we also have the cerebral peduncles located on the ventral surface of the brain, which contain the uh, pyramidal or cortical spinal tracts. And then we have the superior cerebellar peduncles, which will connect the midbrain to the cerebellum. Okay, here's a, a ventral view showing the cranial nerves that we talked about. Here is this large trigenome nerve, which you are responsible for. So cranial nerve five, then we have six, which is abducens, and then seven, which is facial nerve. And this is the pons. Here is the midbrain. Um, and then uh, having the different peduncles uh, connecting the cerebrum and the cerebellum. And just another lateral view. So we can see the superior cerebellar peduncles, and then we have uh, the cerebellar or cerebral peduncles. So cerebellar peduncles and cerebral peduncles. So within the midbrain, the cerebral aqueduct is actually surrounded by gray matter. It's called periaqueductal gray matter. Uh, this is involved in two related functions. The fight or flight reactions, so our sympathetic responses, also mediates the response to visceral pain, so pain coming from our organs. Then we have our corpora quadrigemina, which we talked about. So the corpora quadrigemina are the largest nuclei, and they're divided into superior and inferior colliculi. We have the superior colliculi. These are the nuclei that act in visual reflexes. So when we see an object and it's moving, we can track this object with our eyes. The inferior colliculi, these are the nuclei that are acting in a reflexive response to sound. So for example, I throw my pencil and I can hear the sound of the pencil uh, where it lands or the, the noise it makes when it lands. So again, here is uh, that dorsal view of the uh, brainstem. So we can see the corpora quadrigemina. We have the um, superior colliculi, and then we have the inferior colliculi. So again, superior colliculi responsible for our visual reflexes, whereas the inferior colliculi being uh, responsible for our auditory reflexes. Uh, not a real uh, need to know, but a good to know. So in the white matter of the midbrain, we have two pigmented nuclei. We have the substantia nigra. Uh, these are neuronal cell bodies containing uh, melanin. Um, they're called substantia nigra because they look like a black substance. Uh, again, contain, contain neural cell bodies that contain uh, melanin or melanin. These are functionally linked to the basal nuclei. And then we have the red nucleus that lies deep to the substantia nigra. This is the largest nucleus of the reticular formation. We have the cerebellum. This is located dorsal to the pons and the medulla. Uh, cerebellum, again, responsible for smoothing and coordinating body movements and helps maintain equilibrium. So the cerebellum consists of two cerebellar hemispheres. The surfaces are folded into ridges called folia, and these folia are also separated by fissures. The hemispheres were, are then further divided into lobes. So we have anterior lobe, posterior lobe, and a flocculonodular lobe, or a tiny lobe. So these are the three different lobes of the cerebellum. When I was doing autism research, we were looking at um, anterior as well as posterior lobe for differences in autistic patients versus normal patients within the cerebellum. Here we see the cerebellum uh, located posterior, posteriorly, um, and we can see a sagittal section. So this white matter here, this is what is known as the arbor vitae, so the tree of life. Basically, we can see it looks like uh, branches of a tree, so this matter, this white matter right here being the arbor vitae. And then we can see these little folds uh, that 
look like um, the ends or the tips of the leaves coming off of the tree. These are the folia, and you can see how they kind of make little folds on the outside portion of the cerebellum. And then you have the different lobes. You have the anterior lobe as well as the posterior lobe. And then anterior to the cerebellum, again, here is that fourth ventricle draining cerebrospinal fluid from the uh, cerebral aqueduct. And then a continuation of the of the uh, fourth ventricle would be the central canal within the spinal cord. Um, and then we also have our medial and lateral apertures that you can't really see here. So here's just an illustration of the parasagittal section of the cerebellum. We do have choroid plexuses or a choroid plexus in the fourth ventricle. Again, these structures are responsible for making cerebrospinal fluid. Um, and then we see this white matter making up the arbor vitae, and then the folds making up the folia. So we have an anterior lobe as well as a posterior lobe. And here, just a little bit anterior to the posterior lobe, is that flocculonodular lobe or that tiny lobe. The cerebellum is composed of three regions. We have an outer cortex uh, made up of gray matter. We have the arbor vitae, the tree of life. Again, that's the internal white matter that looks like branches of a tree. Within the cerebellum, we have what are known as deep cerebellar nuclei. Uh, these are deeply situated gray matter, or deeply situated within the gray matter. And you can kind of see, if you ever get to slice up a section of cerebellum, you can actually see these long ribbons within the gray matter. And those are the cerebellar nuclei. So again, function of the cerebellum is to help coordinate body movements. The cerebellar cortex receives three types of information. It receives information on equilibrium, and we have that coming from uh, the structures within our ear, the inner ear. Uh, we have information on current movements of the limbs, neck, and trunk, so our proprioception, and then information from the cerebral cortex. In coordinating movement, the cerebellum receives information on movement from the motor, motor cortex of the cerebrum. Uh, the cere cerebellum then compares intended movement with body position. The cerebellum will then send instructions back to the cerebral cortex to continuously adjust and fine-tune motor commands. There are other high cognitive functions or higher cognitive functions of the cerebellum, such as learning a new motor skill, like playing the piano or playing an instrument, uh, or learning how to play uh, a sport. Also participates in cognition, uh, such as language, uh, problem solving, and task planning. Now the cerebellar peduncles contain thick tracts connecting the cerebellum to this brainstem. So we have the superior cerebellar peduncles, the middle cerebellar peduncles, and inferior cerebellar peduncles. Um, and now fibers to and from the cerebellum are ipsilateral, meaning they're on the same side. It's not until fibers reach that decussation of the pyramids where uh, the fibers become contralateral. So here at this point, fibers to and from the cerebellum are still ipsilateral, so on the same side. So moving on after the cerebellum, we then have the diencephalon. The diencephalon forms the central core of the forebrain. The diencephalon is surrounded by the cerebral hemispheres and is composed of three paired structures. We have the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. Um, the diencephalon borders the third ventricle and is, basically it surrounds the third ventricle, is primarily composed of gray matter. So here we can see uh, parts of the diencephalon. So if I kind of uh, highlight this area right here, this is considered the diencephalon. So the diencephalon, of course, is made up of different parts. Uh, we have this egg-like structure here. This is the, uh, the thalamus. The thalamus on both sides encloses the third ventricle. And then you have this um, interthalamic adhesion kind of connecting the two thalami on both sides. But between them would be the third ventricle. <laughs> 
So the thalamus is located here and below it and a little bit more anterior, this is the hypothalamus right here. So this area is the hypothalamus. We know that the hypothalamus has releasing hormones that will then uh, give signals to the pituitary gland to secrete hormones. Okay, so we have the thalamus, the hypothalamus, we have the pituitary gland. So all these are part of the diencephalon. And here is just another mid sagittal section of the brain, a gross specimen. So in here would be considered, um, this whole section right here, this whole region is the diencephalon with its, with its different parts. We have the thalamus here. And then a little bit more posterior, we have what's known as the epithalamus that is made up of the posterior commissure as well as the pineal gland. So we can see the pineal gland, um, sorry, here a little bit more posteriorly. So posterior commissure and the pineal gland, okay? And that makes up the epithalamus. And then we have the thalamus here, the egg-like structures, and then we have the hypothalamus. The thalamus makes up 80% of the diencephalon and contains approximately a, do a dozen major nuclei. The diencephalon or the thalamus acts as a relay station for incoming sensory message or messages. Every part of brain communicating with cerebral cortex relays signals through the thalamic nuclei. Um, it then will send axons to regions of the cerebral cortex. So we have afferent impulses that can converge on the thalamus and will synapse in at least one of its nuclei. It's known as the gateway to the cerebral cortex. Uh, we know that nuclei organize and amplify or tone down signals within the thalamus. Then here we can see the different nuclei within the thalamus. Um, so we have uh, the lateral dorsal nucleus, we have medial dorsal, uh, the geniculate bodies, medial and lateral geniculate bodies, uh, VPL, ventral, posterior, lateral, ventral, lateral, uh, ventral, anterior. So luckily you don't have to know what all of these nuclei do. Just know that they're basically named for uh, where they are located within the thalamus. So we can see it looks like an egg. It's an egg-like structure. And between uh, the two are where you can find the, um, the, the third ventricle. And then we have the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus lies between the optic chiasm and the mammillary bodies with the pituitary gland projecting inferiorly. And the hypothalamus contains approximately a dozen nuclei. It is the main visceral control center of the body. So functions of the hypothalamus, and we've listed a lot in lab. So we know it controls the autonomic nervous system with the sympathetic and uh, parasympathetic responses helps with the control of emotional responses, regulation of body temperature, a regulation of hunger and thirst sensations, control of behavior, regulation of sleep-wake cycles, uh, control of the endocrine system, as well as the formation of memory. Okay. So here we can see the different nuclei within the hypothalamus. Um, so these nuclei are responsible for uh, secreting releasing hormones that will eventually tell either the anterior or posterior pituitary gland to release hormones. We know that, for example, if we remember, if I, well, I remember, I had a mnemonic, uh, VSOP, which uh, stands for the hormones that are released from the uh, posterior pituitary gland. So V stands for vasopressin, and vasopressin is actually um, stimulated by uh, the, uh, whatchamacallit, the supraoptic nucleus. So the supraoptic nucleus will send signals to the posterior pituitary gland uh, to secrete vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone. Then we have the paraventricular nuclei, so VSOP, um, oxytocin. Oxytocin is actually stimulated by um, the paraventricular nucleus which tells the posterior pituitary gland to secrete oxytocin. So VSOP, Remy Martin VSOP, that's something I remembered. You don't have to know this, but it's just 
That's a good to know. Another part of the diencephalon is the epithalamus. The epithalamus forms part of the roof or top of the third ventricle, consists of a tiny group of nuclei, and includes the pineal gland or the pineal body. Pineal gland is important because it secretes the hormone melatonin. Uh, melatonin is that hormone that helps regulate the sleep-wake cycle. Um, so melatonin is a hormone, again, secreted by the pineal gland. Um, we know that the pineal gland is also under the influence of the hypothalamus, aids in the control of our circadian rhythms. You can also get uh, melatonin over the counter, um, which a lot of people use as a short-term treatment for uh, sleeping or people who are having trouble sleeping. Now the cerebral hemispheres account for 83% of brain mass. We have structures called fissures. Fissures are deep grooves that separate major regions of the brain, and we have some really important fissures. We have the transverse fissure. The transverse fissure separates the cerebrum and the cerebellum. We then have this large longitudinal fissure. The longitudinal fissure is the fissure that separates right and left cerebral hemispheres. We then have structures called sulci. Sulci is actually plural, sulcus is singular. Sulci are grooves on the surface of the cerebral hemispheres. They're considered shallow valleys of the brain. Again, sulci are considered shallow valleys of the brain. And then we have gyri. Gyri is plural, gyrus is singular. Uh, gyri are twisted ridges between sulci. Um, these are considered um, twisters in the brain. Again, these are considered twisters in the brain. Now, prominent gyri and sulci are similar in all people. So deeper sulci will divide the cerebrum into lobes, and the lobes are named for the skull bones overlying them. The central sulcus of Rolando separates the frontal and the parietal lobes. Um, it is bordered by two very important gyri. We have the precentral gyrus and the postcentral gyrus, and we know that the precentral gyrus and the postcentral gyrus have very important functions. So again, the central sulcus of Rolando, separating the frontal and parietal lobes, and then bordered by the precentral gyrus, so the gyrus uh, anterior to the central sulcus of Rolando, and the postcentral gyrus, which is posterior to the central sulcus of Rolando. So here we can see uh, a picture of um, the lobes and the sulci and fissures of the cerebral hemispheres. So here we have this central sulcus of Rolando separating the frontal lobe and the parietal lobes. And then here are the gyri that border the central sulcus of Rolando. You have the precentral gyrus anterior to the sulcus and the postcentral gyrus uh, posterior to the sulcus. And then we have our fissures. You can't really see the fissures, the longitudinal fissure from this view, but we can see the transverse fissure. So the transverse fissure, again, is that fissure that separates the cerebrum from the cerebellum. Uh, we do have some other major structures. Uh, we have the lateral sulcus here, uh, forming that border between the temporal lobe as well as the uh, frontal and parietal lobes. And then we have another sulcus, the parieto occipital sulcus here, separating the parietal lobe from the occipital lobe. And then again, these gyri are kind of elevations or twisters within the brain, and the sulci are um, known as the shallow valleys of the brain. So a fissure is basically just a very deep sulcus. Parietal occipital sulcus again separates the occipital from the parietal lobe. The lateral sulcus separates the temporal lobe from the parietal and frontal lobes. And then we have the insula. If you kind of reflect back the uh, temporal as well as the frontal and parietal lobes, we get to the structure called the insula. Now, the insula is considered lobe number five 
of the cerebral hemisphere. Again, the insula is considered lobe number five of the cerebral hemisphere. So the other four lobes include the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, occipital lobe, temporal lobe, and lobe number five, which is the insula. Again, these lobes named for the bones in the skull that lie on top of them. So if we track, retract the frontal lobe and part of the temporal lobe, we can get to the insula. And here you can see the gyri of the insula deep in the lateral sulcus, again, uh, considered lobe number five. And here we see that central sulcus of Rolando separating the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. Now the cerebral cortex is the home of our conscious mind. It enables us to be aware of ourselves and our sensations, initiate and control voluntary movements, as well as communicate, remember, and understand. It basically makes us who we are. It is composed of gray matter that contains neuronal cell bodies, dendrites, and short axons. Um, the folds in the cortex triples its size and makes up about approximately 40% of the brain's mass. Now we have areas called Brodmann areas, and these are 47 structurally distinct areas. And we've able, been able to map them uh, to kind of figure out what these areas do. Um, we can map them into functional regions. Now, there is a way... The CNS has a way to map its neurons, and this is called sonatotopy. Sonatotopy is spelled S-O-N-A-T-O-T-O-P-Y. Uh, sonatotopy is the CNS's way to map its neurons. But we use Brodmann, Brodmann's areas to uh, have distinct areas uh, so that we can uh, pinpoint certain uh, functions within these areas. Now, functional regions are traditionally studied. Um, so we were able to study brain injured people and animals, and we can kind of figure out what some of these regions do. Uh, we always have new discoveries using PET scans or um, MRIs. Uh, we, have, we do have the regions of the cerebral cortex that perform distinct motor and sensory functions. However, memory and language are spread over a wide area. We have three kinds of functional areas. We have the sensory areas. We have the association areas and the motor areas. We do have a sensory area for each of the major, major senses. We have a primary sensory cortex. So each primary sensory cortex has an association area that processes sensory information. These are the sensory association areas. We also have multimodal association areas. These receive and integrate input from multiple regions of the cerebral cortex. We have the motor cortex. The motor cortex, um, located in the precentral gyrus, plans and initiates voluntary motor functions. So once we receive information from uh, the senses that goes up the ascending tracts of the spinal cord, it is here in the motor cortex which will plan and initiate proper voluntary responses and sends its axons uh, down the descending uh, pathways of the spinal cord to the effector organ, such as a, a muscle or a gland. So sensory information um, is received by the primary sensory cortex. This is where we have our integration or our information processing. The infor information relayed is related to sensory association area. Uh, we have multimodal association areas that receive input in parallel from sensory areas, and then we have a motor plan that is enacted. And here is a crazy um, busy slide that shows you all the different functional areas of the cerebral cortex. No, you don't have to know all of them, but know that we do have areas for taste, for vision, for hearing, 
we know that uh, for hearing, it's mostly located near the temporal lobe, near our ear. That makes sense. Vision, uh, most of the visual um, areas, they're in the occipital lobe. Okay, and then we have areas for taste um, here. And then we have um, our motor cortex. Our primary motor cortex is in the precentral gyrus just anterior to the central sulcus of Rolando, okay? So know that there are primary cortexes for each of the senses. And we can also see it, um, more of them within this sagittal section of the brain. Um, I don't expect you to be able to identify the, the different areas. Just know that they exist, okay? So sensory areas, these are cortical areas involved in conscious awareness of sensation. They're located in the parietal lobes, the temporal lobes, as well as the occipital lobes. Uh, distinct regions of each lobe can interpret each of the major senses. The primary somatosensory cortex is within the post-central gyrus. So the primary motor cortex is in the pre-central gyrus, whereas the primary somatosensory cortex, this is in the post-central gyrus. These are, this gyrus is involved with the conscious awareness of general somatic senses. Uh, for example, spatial discrimination. We can precisely locate a stimulus. If I place my finger um, on attack, or if I place my finger on something hot, I know exactly where this stimulus is. Um, and then certain regions, certain regions are more adept at distinguishing precise stimuli. Now projection is contralateral. What does that mean? It means it's on the different side or opposite side. So the cerebral hemispheres will receive sensory input from the opposite side of the body. So for example, if something's going on in my right foot, uh, the left uh, cerebral hemisphere will receive that information. And then we can see a sensory homunculus. A sensory homunculus is a body map of the sensory cortex. We also have a motor homunculus, um, which we'll talk about soon. So here we can see um, if we go along that post-central gyrus, we can see where we are receiving the sensory information. So more lateral parts on the right um, include the pharynx from the tongue to teeth, gums, and jaws, the face, and then we have the fingers, the arm, or the forearm, the arm, and the head, neck, trunk, hip, leg, knee, foot, and then the genital areas. And this is on, uh, I'm sorry, this is on the left. So this is the sensory map um, in the post-central gyrus. We also have a motor map in the pre-central gyrus, basically uh, the same structures, but it, within the pre-central gyrus, okay? So we have our homunculus for the uh, pre-central gyrus, um, signifying motor, um, where uh, it will send its motor signals. And then we have sensory input uh, in the post-central gyrus coming from these different structures, okay, within the different regions of the gyrus. The sensory area, the somatosensory association cortex will lie posterior to the primary somatosensory cortex, and then will integrate different sensory inputs such as touch and pressure. Uh, these draw upon stored memories of past sensory experiences. So you're able to recognize keys or coins in your pocket without even looking at them. You know that they're there. So basically you're, you're drawing from past memories of these objects. The primary visual cortex located deep within the calcarine sulcus. This is the medial part of the occipital lobe. So if you think of visual cortex, think of the occipital lobe, that's where it's located. This is the largest of all the sensory areas, receives visual information that originates in the retina and exhibits contralateral function. So if we're receiving information, for example, from the left eyeball, it will go towards the right uh, primary visual cortex because we have that optic chiasm that allows those fibers to uh, kind of cross over and go to the other side. Uh, first of a series of areas processing visual input. 
And then we have the visual association area, which surrounds the primary visual area, which will continue to process visual information and analyzes color, form, and movement. Uh, complex, complex visual processing will then extend into the temporal and parietal lobes. We then have the primary auditory co uh, cortex. We know that it's located within the temporal lobe. Its function is the conscious awareness of sound. We know that sound waves will excite receptors in the ear, and these impulses are then transmitted to the primary auditory cortex within the temporal lobe. If we have a primary auditory co cortex, of course, we'll have an auditory association area. Um, this is posterior to the primary auditory cortex and permits evaluation of different sounds. It will, processes, it will process auditory stimuli serially and in parallel. So we have the posterior lateral uh, pathway, which is the where pathway, and we have the anterior lateral, which is the what pathway. So where is the sound coming from and what is the sound? Okay. This lies in the center of Wernicke's area, um, which is one of those Broadman areas. Areas. So Wernicke's area is involved in recognizing and understanding speech. The vestibular cortex is responsible for conscious awareness of sense of balance. It is located in the posterior part of the insula deep to the lateral sulcus. Gustatory cortex involved in conscious awareness of taste stimuli. Uh, this is on the roof of the lateral sulcus. And then we have the olfactory cortex, uh, which will be in the medial aspect of the cerebrum, uh, located in the piriform lobe. This olfactory cortex um, receives impulses from the olfactory nerves, cranial nerve one. Um, so the olfactory nerves will transmit these impulses to the olf olfactory cortex and provide conscious awareness of smells. Um, so we know that the olfactory cortex is part of the rhine encephalon or the nose brain. Uh, it includes the piriform lobe, the olfactory tracts, and the olfactory bulbs, connects the brain to the limbic system. Uh, the limbic system involved with emotions and memory. So this is why smells can trigger different emotions. Uh, if we have, you know, the scent of an ex-boyfriend's cologne kind of brings up memories of a past relationship, or you know how home smells like whenever you go home to your parents' house. It just smells like home because it triggers up all those memories of what we consider to be home. Um, it's, and that's due to the connection of the olfactory cortex to the limbic system. So olfactory cortex is also involved with consciously identifying and recalling specific smells. Okay, so um, I'm going to stop here with the sensory areas for chapter 13, and we will continue on with part two of chapter 13 in another uh, video.